And, I, and what we're going to talk to you about is what one could potentially do right uh, in choosing whatever you're doing. Right now, I'm mostly going to talk about doing an associate of art. I would try to inspire in you that you can actually do more than that, choosing some type of degree. Now, one of the scariest things is, I think, at least for me, is what am I going to do? What should I do? What could I do? Right? It's kind of scary. That's like a big thought. I have to make this commitment in some way. The other part would be, I have to leave where I am, where I'm comfortable. That's the other part, right? There's those scary things. And then how do you find that? So you're not the only one that doesn't know what they want to do yet, right? When you look at the statistics on this, and you're trying to choose a college degree, you know, 21% don't really even know what they want. In fact, um, I had wished all my children had decided to be like me, but almost every one of them said, no. Dad works all the time, he's doing math, he's writing stuff, and he's like, I don't want to be like that. Although my son decided he wanted to be an electrical engineer, and it was funny, he was telling my three other daughters, uh, older daughters, he said, don't tell dad, but I like math. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Because math is a way you communicate ideas and change things. In fact, in all of these professions, right, that is a way in which we communicate. It's a language. And we just have to adopt it, right? We have to learn the grammar, the sentence construction. And in doing so, you can create change. Change in your community, change in your life. So it's OK not to know. And when you get there, now this is the part I was telling you that's scary, right? I'm not really sure what I want to do. What I want, you know. You just saw civil engineering, huge field that can impact all sorts of things. But prior to coming here, did you know what a civil engineer did? No. All you knew is a word called engineer. But there's more. when I get done with this, I guarantee you there's a lot of things that we can do. And there's more than one discipline in this area. So changing your mind along the road is OK. But the first step is going. Going to a four-year college to be able to advance where you are. And I know you have the potential for this. I have no doubt in my mind about that. So it's OK. So select a degree. You know, the other thing is, once you get there, sometimes you get stage fright. <clears throat> and you're not really too sure what to do with it, so you keep taking classes, right? And you don't declare a major. That's one of the challenges that happens with students. Gabe talked a little bit about that. Um, I had one of my children do the same thing. And um, the consequence of that is, when you get there, and you haven't made a decision, and let's say you're in year two, some students are in year three, they still haven't decided to keep taking general elective. You find out that things will progress in whatever discipline you finally decide to be in, and then you end up having to take things over. So you have to make up your mind, and it's OK to do that. So that's one thing, right? So go ahead, create a degree plan. Create a path that's going to allow you to go forward. Now, there's differences between a bachelor's of art and a bachelor's of science. And if you're focusing on uh, liberal arts, in the more general context, you know these are mostly non-STEM related activities, and that's science, technology, engineering, and math. You know things like education, and English, and humanities, languages, literature, being able to write, artistic people, right, social media, social studies, all those things. When you talk about bachelors of science, then you're talking about biology, chemistry, computers, engineering, which I said I'll talk about mathematics, physics. These are other disciplines that are highly reliant upon math and these type of things that help you move forward. And you have the skills for this. So <clears throat> when you're selecting a degree between these two, you're going to focus on one. So we're talking about education, human development, liberal arts. We're going to talk about two examples. We're going to focus on liberal arts and focus on engineering. But this kind of gives you an idea that when you go into bachelor's of science, um, we'll focus on this one first. The college itself will have multiple things within it. We'll actually have another level of this. So agriculture, architecture, business college, geosciences, life sciences, veterinary science, engineering. So Bachelor of Science has multiple things within it. Education the same. Um, Bachelor of Arts mostly focuses in the softer areas of, of science and Bachelor of Science, life sciences, engineering, math related. So, if you look at the Bachelor of Art, 
These are, and we're just focusing on one subject area, liberal, or, uh, liberal arts, a very popular area. One of my daughters in the social sciences is this one, one of my daughters. Um, one of them might be you love music, right? And if you decided you love music and that's something that you have a strong passion for, then these are some of the areas that you might emphasize. You know, instrumental, voice, classics, theater, right? being able to do these type of things that would be related to this. If you're interested in English, if you want to write literature, classics, communication, you know, communicate with people. Other people take English also for another reason. That's because they want to become a lawyer, being able to communicate. Social sciences, history, political science, government, human development. These are things that you would emphasize. Communication, media, journalism. Although communication, I would say, is something that we all must do whether you like it or not, right? And how effectively you communicate, you learn over time. But this is a discipline to help you learn how to do that effectively. If you look at Bachelor of Science, and we're just focusing in the science field, so as I said, um, you have colleges. And if we're focusing on the College of Science, then the College of Science would have within it things like biology, geoscience, something they call engineering, I'd say, eh. But anyhow, <clears throat> engineering, that's architectural, petroleum engineering, although that depends on uh, what university or college you're at, so that mostly it falls under the College of Engineering. But anyhow, you know, computer science, business, and so if you like things like microbiology, little bugs, right? <clears throat> that would be something you want to do, or zoology, identification of different um, animals, etc. If you like working in the lab where you're looking at microbes, bacteria, doing strep culture, right? That's you. Um, most people take a biology path is because they want to go to medical school, right? because that's a discipline that helps prepare you for that. Although nowadays, you would find that more people are coming out of other disciplines besides biology to, to go to medical school. I don't know if you knew that or not. Because they do. So you'll find people going into engineering, and the reason for it is because uh, what you're going to find out is engineering is highly structured. We create people that are problem solvers. That's what we that's what we create. We make you a problem solver, whether you like it or not. Geosciences, geology, geography, metrol, um, <clears throat> meteorology, environmental, you know, so you can be in all sorts of places based on that. So maybe you work for Exxon. So you go throughout the world um, looking at the ground. Yeah, people, uh, people fall in love with that. As you might guess, I don't really want to do that. Okay, but anyhow, that's, this is a field that people fall in love with. Um, if you're in computer science, uh, maybe you do coding. You know what coding is? Hmm? Any guesses? Throw me out a guess. What's coding? Okay, so if we're using what you just said. We're using that language to come up with a series of commands to make it do something. So we might say, I want to take three steps here in this way. Now I can shake your hand. If you like. Right? I just now coded. That was my code. And then I said, when I'm done with that, return back to point zero and do it again. But we do it on a large scale, right? So now if you want to create an image, you would do exactly the same thing, but now you'd sell all the pixels to do something on your screen. Kind of cool, right? And then we'd say, if you interact with it, do this, if they do that. So that's coding. Um, gaming, you can use that. Network, so you know, if you want to talk to each other through computer, your computer, someone will actually be involved in doing that. I remember the first um, networking person I ever met was when I was at 3M. We had a new computer system in our um, facility and his job was to connect us all together. And you know why they wanted to connect us together? Why? So they could monitor what we're doing? <laughs> no, so that we could work more effectively. And that was important to them, right? Because let's get down to it, right? 3M is about money. 
right? There is a business, they're responsible to their shareholders. And so your ability to communicate with each other is very important to be able to move forward. So this gives you an idea of um, Bachelor of Science in the College of Science. Now, in talking about College of Engineering, um, it's a little bit bigger. Uh, you have more areas that you work in, and I will talk about all these a little bit more in detail. You have things like material science and engineering. You have nuclear engineering, civil engineering, which we just heard a little snapshot about, snapshot about. Electrical engineering, industrial engineering, mechanical, aerospace, biomedical, chemical, computer science. So you have multiple areas. Yeah? What is the area? It's a very system and I'll talk a little bit further about it. But these all have different areas where, foundationally, again, what is it that I said that is the common language we use? You go to the M. Yeah. Math. We use math as a language to be able to communicate things with each other to change things. So if we're looking at mechanical engineers, I mean, they do all sorts of stuff. But here's one idea right here for you. Here's someone that works on propulsion engines. So here you're looking at a jet engine. So if any of you traveled around, you know, this is an interesting area. It's an area of thermodynamics. In fact, the first creation of thermodynamics, which is the change of some matter into another form, was for locomotive engines. You now, the first generation of locomotive engines was involved in, we'd create this big boiler, we'd throw coal in it, we'd convert that water that was in there into steam, and we'd use the steam to move pistons to do motion. And thermodynamics was to be able to describe that process, being able to describe the change in matter to do work. So they do exactly the same thing. In comes a fuel, it's compressed, and out shoots an enormous amount of energy that moves your plane and lifts it off the ground. Now they do other stuff besides that. There's a lot of first principles here. I was on a plane right up this day, giving a talk at University of Arizona in Tucson. And I was on the plane, and I got off, and there's one guy, just got off the plane, he's coming from Japan, and he's working for Titleist Golf Clubs. And I, you know, overheard, you know, not that I was trying to eavesdrop, but I just heard because he was kind of happy that he was coming back home, because he got tired of sushi, he was coming back from Japan. And he was a mechanical engineer, and his job was to look at how to make golf clubs and hit balls. So, Mechanical engineering interfaces in all sorts of different areas. So this is just one example. Yeah. So not just jet engines, but all sorts of areas. Or maybe you're looking at being a manufacturing engineer, right? So you design equipment to be able to do work for you, right? So design a facility of products, um, physical plant layouts maybe, existing machines, um, how you interface with facilities, purchasing equipment, packaging products, shipping to the market. These are all important areas. So this Coke that you have right here that you just drank, that would be manufactured. Somebody came up with the idea of how you create that bottle that you have right here, which is made out of polyethylene terephthalate. So that's it. It has a certain quality in it, etc. Very interesting material. And they came up with ideas about how you transport the water to the plant, the sugar, the raw materials, the transportation costs, because ultimately what you want to do is you want to make sure that you can sell this and make a profit on it. That's manufacturing engineering. Or your industrial engineer. We used to have an industrial engineering department here. Um, they play in all sorts of areas throughout the industry. Uh, design products, um, look at plant layouts. So here's a woman here looking at, um, I can't really think what this is right now. Uh, anyhow, working on a plant layout, looking at existing machines. But so right here you have a robocaster right here. So it actually creates three dimensional products. So just kind of looking at that thing. Um, and look at facilities, uh, packaging again, shipping. So lots of different areas that they contribute. Electrical engineer, which my son wants to be involved in, they is involved in all sorts of different areas, and it just keeps growing with time. But you know, you're interested in basically moving 
electrons. It's probably one of the most famous people, or at least there's a competition between the two. Where, um, anyone's heard of Edison? He wasn't really an electrical engineer. But he was one, one involved in doing what? What did Edison do? He made the light bulb. He made the light bulb. I'm going to correct you on that in just a moment. And the other guy that there was competing about it was Tesla. Has anyone heard of Tesla? Yeah. What do you know about Tesla? Uh, from what I've heard is that Edison stole his ideas from Tesla. Well, they fought against each other. Yeah. So Tesla, I would say, is a foundational man. I think he got a Nobel Prize, if I'm correct. Did he get a Nobel Prize? I think Tesla did. I have to check. Guy was so far ahead of his time, and he used math to figure out how to move energy, electricity. So you've heard of things like the Tesla coil. Yeah, and there's cough. Or coming out of here, we have what we call the difference between alternating current and direct current. Now Edison, his saying was 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. Have you ever heard that saying before? Yeah. What does it mean? Since you've heard the saying before. Do you know what that means? It doesn't take much to put out a big energy. Okay, so what he meant was this, because this is his whole approach of solving this. He'd go, I don't know how it works, but I'm just gonna keep trying and trying and trying, and I'm never gonna give up, and then eventually I will somehow figure out how it works. So the light bulb was created by others. What he did was he saw their idea and said, I know how to make it and manufacture it. And I'm just going to keep trying and trying and trying and trying. And eventually, he figured it out. And then what he did is he created a whole infrastructure to run on light bulb. And where he didn't understand things is he didn't understand that direct current has directly proportional relationship between resistance or how far these electrons travel and how much it takes to do that. It takes a lot of energy to do that. So you can, So if you look at this, there's this movie coming out. You think it's against Edison and Tesla. Please go see it and actually see this. Then talk about it. So Edison was trying to promote his idea and said, "Okay, this is how you do it. You know, we're going to use direct current energy. We're going to use my light bulbs. We're going to use my infrastructure because mine's the best." And then what he did on top of that to try to convince you it was the best, he took um, alternating current that Tesla had first done by math and then shown in principle, and then he electrocuted a cow and said, see how dangerous alternating current is? You can't use it. So then there was a competition of trying to get, this is true, you know, watch this in small movie. So then after that, he, there was a competition between them. There was a problem with what Edison was doing because he couldn't trans translate this energy very far at all. But Tesla used alternating current. Well, it's unique about alternating current just like the word says, the current goes like this. And it moves in waves. Direct current goes like this. And so when it moves like this, and it's moving through a copper coil, it bumps into other things that are in the way. And you know what happens when you bump into people, right? There's some friction that's created. So it creates heat. By the time you get to the end, there's almost no more current left, because you lost it all. But alternating current moves through everything. It's like, I don't see anyone. So I can travel a thousand miles and nothing happens. Direct current, not far, blocks. And this is, Tesla came up with this foundation for math first. And so everything in the world now operates on alternating current, not direct current. So he developed motors and all these interesting stuff. But anyhow, this is why my son wants to be involved. It's very cool. So I'm happy he wants to be nerdy like me. It's just that he didn't choose my field. Um, there's also computer engineering, and I used to have some uh, little robotic things here, but you know, then they're talking about you know design hardware, software, computer science is really an interesting area. There's it, it impacts so many different things nowadays. Um, I can't even cover all the fields it touches. You know, everything from biology. Um, how you do things really that's just, it's just so dramatically huge. And then, of course, if we talk about civil and construction engineering, you just saw that this idea of building things is incredibly important. It was, I forgot his name now, the Babylonian guy. 
Say it again. Amorabi. Am Amorabi, yeah. So wouldn't that, wouldn't that be cool if you know politicians had to do the same thing? You know, you have to tell the truth, and if you don't tell the truth and don't help people, then you have to die. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> Anyhow, that was my political <laughs> statement there. <laughs> But you know, in the engineering fields, right, we have to be honest in what we do. And I, I actually I prefer that in life because we have to be we have to be black and white, zero and one. And it's nice, right? Because we, you know, we people's lives depend on what we do. So as was talked about, you know, civil and construction engineering impacts so many things. You know, like space launch facilities, if you want to work for NASA, offshore structures. And as was talked about, bridges, buildings, highways, transportation systems, dams, airports, irrigation, tunnels, treatment and distribution of water, collection of water and treatment, um, uh, wastewater treatment, how water flows and it's a big deal in the Northeast. So it's huge. Um, anyway. Or if you want to be a biomedical engineer, it's kind of a newer field. Biomedical engineering um, takes in multiple disciplines. It takes in uh, the idea of the mechanics of biology to understand how bodies move, right? It takes in, what I would say actually it's really uh, mechanical engineering, but they call it medical engineering. It's motion. How do you do motion? Uh, distribute force. And then they call it clinical engineering, which is really chemical engineering. I don't know why they put that in there. But anyhow, this is what it is. It takes in three disciplines together. Um, takes its edges of these to be able to address things related to, as you see right here, a knee, or maybe a heart, artificial heart. Interesting here. Or maybe you're an automotive mechanical engineer, right? <clears throat> I don't think I want to ever have a picture taken of me riding something like that. <laughs> I think somebody would laugh at me a lot. <laughs> they would use it as leverage. But anyhow, you can see, right, they design all services. So automobiles, trucks, tractors, bulldozers, motorcycles. Uh, they deal with engine design, structural design, tire design. It's actually a huge deal. So if you want to work for, let's say, good new chemical, and you want to be an automotive engineer, this is something that you do. So force, friction, durability. In fact, um, when I was at San Diego National Labs, we had Goodyear, because Goodyear, as a company, was going down, down, down. And the reason was because uh, their tires weren't very good. And so they wanted to work with us as scientists to help them improve uh, using computational modeling, material science to improve their tires. And so they actually, their first generation tire that was far better than they ever created was known as the Vectra tire. So if you want to look at that, you'll see, you know, not so good and it was a huge jump in their abilities. But it, it, it lets you do lots of different things. Anyway. So, you asked about aerospace. So, aerospace, there's actually two areas of this aerospace and aeronautical engineering. Um, <clears throat> if we're talking about uh, an aerospace engineer, right, we're talking about aerodynamics, propulsion, control systems, structure, so you can be building planes, things like that. If you're yeah, an astronaut engineer, then you're talking about what does it take to get the space shuttle up in the air? What does it take to bring it back down? all the materials and all the energy required to do that. So it's actually pretty big. Um, deals with all these things, deal with some degree of dynamics, material science, navigation, um, a little bit different where they're talking about um, astronautical engineers that you also have to deal with radiation, right? how materials change over time due to being exposed to help them down with radiation. Does that kind of answer your question about I forgot who was asking that one there. You're asking that? But also want to know. Yeah, planes, all sorts of things like that. Very good. Yeah. Boeing 777, and that's an aeronautical engineer that with a Boeing facility in there. You created those composite things, which are huge. And so I saw the facility that they're doing this at. You know, all making that carbon composites. I'm a little afraid of that, but that's what they're doing. Mostly because I'm a polymer scientist and I know how that stuff works. But anyhow, that's what they did. Or maybe you want to be an agricultural engineer. You heard earlier, um, I think it was Dr. Mosley. Is that right? Jackson. Jackson, Dr. Jackson. Jackson. So his back, background is agriculture engineer. So here you're dealing with soil and water, 
food engineering, power engineering, structure engineering, electrical generation, bringing all these things together. This idea, though, is not new. It's another very old area. So if you look at what the Incas did, so you just heard about that transportation highway going up from the northern part of South America all through the Andes, all the way down to this bottom. The problem with being way up there at this high elevation, which you'd never guess, is it's basically a high desert. Did you know that? Almost no water. So she knows because she lives, lives in New Mexico where I think our average rainfall, total precipitation, I should just put it that way, and in Albuquerque was like 12 or 11 inches a year. Almost, but you get it all at once. That's the other thing. Which doesn't do you much good because the rest of the time you don't have any water. They have beautiful sun. And it's the sun. But anyhow, this is what they had this problem. So they came up with tiering methods and ways to collect water to be able to grow things. So here's your showing, they're showing some tiering that they created and still use today, where water will flow down when it does come and collects in these areas, and that way they have water to be able to grow things. So that's agriculture kind of thing, right? It deals with these little five areas. Um, it's been around for quite some time. Agriculture, um, archi architectural engineering, so these beautiful things that are in Sydney. I can't remember what this is called. I forgot the name. Have you seen this picture before? It's an opera house. It's an opera house. Yeah, it's a city opera house. Beautiful, beautiful structure. That's what architecture, architecture, right? They engineer these things. Everything from a beautiful home. I remember seeing some homes that, you know, if you're uh, an architectural engineer, you can create your own home. And whenever you see them, when they sell them their home, you go, oh my gosh, that thing is cool. It always is. <clears throat> but that's what they do, right? The design of a home the design and structure of things, how they come together. So if we had one person back here saying, I want to be a carpenter. I'll say, why don't you be an architectural engineer? Since you're building with wood, imagine creating a structure just the way you want it. So that way, when you go back home in North Dakota where it's super cold, you have exactly what you want. That's what you do. And Chris, yeah. tonight, Tammy Eagle Bowl is an architect. Okay. Okay, awesome. So what is chemical engineering? So now I'm going into my field. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more on this because this is what I do. So if you decide to be a chemical engineer, what do we do? We essentially transform, transform matter. That is what we do. We take something and we convert it into something else in order to achieve something. So as an example down here, maybe what we do is we take some raw material so let's say we're taking the corn and we want to convert it into ethanol and then we want to use it somewhere for fuel. That's what we do. So we transform things and we utilize chemistry, physics, and math as a way to describe something to be able to transform something. That's what we do. Um, so we impact areas that are pretty broad. Um, reactor design. Can, uh, conversion creating of chemicals, so the gasoline that you use, that's what we do. Maybe we're involved in creating new type of energetic fuels, creation of energy, policy, medicine, vaccine, serum, plasma, plastics, textiles. So you can see that we impact quite a bit. And as I said, we're looking at these large areas of being able to change them. So let's say you're working in a field and uh, let's say you decide to be a biologist, right? You create enzymes that do something. Now, as a biologist, you can make it, but then the question then becomes, can you scale it? Can you take that and now make it on a very large scale? And that's what we do. So we would look at that, and describe it, the entire process, you know, looking at the chemistry, the physics of it, the materials themselves, how do they interact, and then we would be able to scale it a much larger system. That's what we do. Or that's one thing that we do. And then while we're doing this, which has become a much more important area, is we also are not only interested in doing this and looking at the economics of that, but we're interested in both its impact environmentally and the safety that is associated with doing that. In fact, um, Have you, any of you ever heard of the Bhopal incident? You don't know it? Bhopal incident in India. 
So, have you ever heard of the company Union Carbides? Okay, so all of us old guys know who it is. Union Carbide was the largest chemical company in the world. In the entire world. They did everything you can imagine under the sun. Theoretical stuff, material science stuff, everything. Uh, polymers, plastics, chemicals. <clears throat> but they built a plant in India, in Bhopal. And a part of the process required that they use phosgene. You know what phosgene is? Have you ever heard the term mustard gas? You heard that term, right? World War I, they used mustard gas. That's phosgene. Phosgene is basically a carbon, you know, with two chlorines on it. And the thing is, it's incredibly reactive. So if you inhale it, what it does, this is how it kills you. It reacts with your tissues and breaks it apart, just turns it into goo, fall apart, and then you die. So you drown in your own, while well, you inhale this thing, it turns your lungs into mush, and so you can't breathe and you die. And it's painful. So, it, but it's also incredibly useful to create chemicals that are incredibly useful, products, etc. So it's really useful. So Union Carbide decided to build a plant in India. Can you guess why? Guess why? Why? Because it costs less, right? People are cheaper. I hate saying the truth, but it's true. It's true. You're absolutely right. It's cheaper. People are cheaper, I don't have to give them health care and all that kind of stuff. Now you, you, you won't read about that, but that's actually what they, that's why they chose it. So they didn't have as many safety regulations as they would have in, let's say, Europe or in the United States. And because of that, what happened is, the spas gene that they're using to create these plastics was released into the atmosphere. So one of these pipes broke that held it. And what happened to them? What did I just tell you what spas gene does? So it killed thousands of people. Not just hundreds, thousands of people died because of this phosgene release. <clears throat> and so we as chemical engineers uh, deal with this. And as a consequence of that, there is no more union carbide in the world today. It does not exist at all. Ever since that happened, they paid out all the cost of all the people and all the things they did and all the reputation of doing something wrong and being dishonest right, about the entire process. This company does not exist at all. Even though the science they did was incredible. I'm pretty sure some of the scientists they had there uh, were probably Nobel laureates in what they did. Anyhow, get the chemical engineer to call that. We also deal with things like scale in terms of metabolic engineering. We use the things that we do to map out um, how enzymes move bacteria, and how enzymes work to be able to make things better. Or maybe we do some interesting science where we look at carbon nanotubes and look at how molecules move down that. We all do chemistry. To be able to design new drugs, new medicines to help people. Or maybe you want to deal with energy. Maybe you want to deal with renewable energy. So the Department of Energy is fun with things like this. Can you guess what this green stuff is? What's it all in the grass of lakes? Moss, algae, all that green stuff. So here they're doing some work with the Department of Energy and they're using it as a way to produce some conversion of carbon dioxide into chemicals. Or maybe you deal with uh, using an ion or you do a fuel cell to be able to convert hydrogen into energy. Or maybe you're looking at materials that you convert into energy and there's fossil fuel in it. Or maybe you're working with photovoltaics, creating new types of solar cells and using that for chemistry of materials to be able to collect electrons. Or maybe you're doing things like creating batteries to restore energy. That's what chemical engineers do. Or perhaps you're dealing with sustainability where you want to impact improving the life of others. Dealing with uh, remedial waste that was created. Or perhaps desalinating water so you have water to drink. Or storing radioactive waste. Or trying to deal with the pollution that's being expelled into the atmosphere. These are things that we do. So if you look at that now, all you know, you saw all these disciplines, and there's numerous of them, right? STEM and non-STEM degrees. And if you look at these, you can kind of look at what uh, where you end up if you were, let's say, an aero engineer or civil engineer, 
mechanical engineer, you can see that this is where you probably end up. So if you're a chemical engineer, most of us end up in industry. Maybe you create your own company. Maybe you go into education. Um, or if you're a civil engineer, there's a lot of people that are working in other government-related fields. So quite large. So their impacts are very large. That's the point. We can end up in lots of different areas. Um, once you become an engineer, irregardless of what discipline you're in, you have lots of different career options to you upon graduation. You can go into the corporate world. Um, you can be an independent person, as I was saying, military or government, social service as well, professional engineers, or a professor maybe like me, uh, go on or do graduate work outside of that, or any mix of these things. Uh, people are, in fact, to give you an idea of how important it is, um, people love hiring lawyers that have engineering degrees. You know why? Can you guess? So what did I say about, so what do you know about lawyers and how do you get a lawyer law degree? What do you say? Gabe yells. Throw it out, Gabe. What do you study? Philosophy. Philosophy. English. History. Where is this math, science, or anything going there? No. So the reason they like us as um, scientists and engineers is because we were trained to become incredibly good at problems, problem solving. When you see something, we immediately analyze. In fact, my wife would tell you, don't try to solve my problems. <laughs> <laughs> she says something, she asks me something, and once she asks me that, you know, immediately I think, okay, A, B, C, D, this is what we do. We're done. Case closed. <laughs> Sometimes people don't want to hear that. Um, as Larry would probably be laughing, he knows this. <laughs> as someone who's been very well and has dealt with people, yeah. So, you know, we are trained to be problem solvers. We look at things and we immediately come up with solutions based on our background. And they want us in law because of that training. We immediately take abstract ideas and we assemble them and we bring them into focus. That's what we do. Yeah. Um, maybe also mention the relation between like the mathematical training and the LSAT exam that you need to take or like study law. Yeah. Well, it's math. Like it. Yeah. <laughs> and again, there you know when you so what Gabe was saying is you know if you decide to go to graduate school, you either take a, a graduate entrance exam or you'll take an LSAT. I can't remember what that abbreviation stands for. I forgot it. But they're aptitude tests. They're kind of like uh, trying to figure out everything you know. And based on that knowledge, would this knowledge that you have allow you to be successful in our field? That's basically what they're looking for. So <clears throat> one of them is math. And again, math, the reason for it is it's a demonstration of your critical thinking. In fact, you do math all the time. You don't even know it. So. How many of you have driven a car? You guys have not driven a car? <laughs> Come on! Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm feeling bad. So, did you know you're doing math? So, if I'm looking at it, it's like, you're totally doing math. And if I'm getting specific about it, you're actually doing kinematics. You're looking at physics. You're looking at acceleration, velocity, position. So you're looking at if I want to stop, I'm going, and I've come to a steady state velocity, so let's say 50 miles per hour, so that's a velocity, a distance of time. And I'm moving, it has some inherent acceleration that's built into this as well. And I want to stop, before I hit that wall, what do I do? I start braking. And in my mind, I'm doing math by looking at the distance, and I slow it down to why I eventually stop. And I stop where I want to stop. You just did a, different, a partial differential equation in your mind, but you didn't even know it. So mixtures of things. <clears throat> so I hope to sh have shown you that all these disciplines are good, right? But they're all a little bit different. 
Some people say brass rosards are dealing with right brain concepts. I don't know about that. I'll be honest. I'm not sure. But this is what they say. That you deal with these concepts and you talk about feelings and big picture, imagination, philosophy, creative, fantasy, beliefs, and these images. That you somehow have an innate ability to look at these things much better than, let's say, the left brain guys, or left brain people. Because we're too logical and detailed and fact oriented. We look at math and science too much. We're too ordered and we like patterns and we deal with reality. We're very practical. But for those reasons, we don't have any creative aspect to us. I would say, <laughs> not really. But this is what they say. But what I would say, though, is this. You want to do something you're passionate about and that you love. Really, that's what I'm saying here. And you can pick that thing. So we have one person that said, you know, I really want to be a construction worker, um, helping build houses, et cetera. I would say, that's awesome. Nothing wrong with that at all. So if we're looking at differences in obtaining your degree, you know, <clears throat> do the thing you're passionate about. Realize that you need to make up your mind as soon as possible because you're going to be spending money getting that degree, right? But I also say that it's, you can always change your mind later on about what you're doing. You can always change those things. So you can kind of see the length of time it takes to do different things. So if you're, you're, you're both, most of you are working on your associate's part or your associate's science, and you know it's going to take around two years. If you decide to go on and get your Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science, and you're talking, you know, four-year degrees kind of thing. If you want to get your master's, you're going to add another two years to that, so then total now becomes six. And if you want to get your PhD, depending on what program you're in and who you work for, it's probably another four years. So if you work for me, I'll make sure you graduate uh, quickly. <clears throat> but the thing is, you know, our impact is very broad. All these engineering and science-related things are broad even in uh, the liberal arts are broad. And they're broad because we impact so many different things. You know, if you become a Nobel laureate, like this guy named Smalley, I kind of wish I had that name. It's kind of short, sync, kind of cool. But what he did is he worked with some scientists and they came up with what was known as the buckyball. Have you ever heard of the buckyball before? No? Yes. Maybe? Sometimes? Don't want to talk about it. All of you it. OK. Anyhow. These guys, some chemists and physicists, came up with this creation of this material, and it's a cage structure. It's actually a ball, small structure. Very interesting material. Uh, it has very interesting properties. And this work that they did, this creation of this buckyball, characterizing it, looking at its properties, led to a Nobel Prize. Now, the cool thing about once you get a Nobel Prize is that everyone thinks you're right. Do I even have one? No. That's why no one thinks I'm right about anything. <laughs> they don't even care what I say. I just have you here because you're trapped and you have to listen to me. Right? But if I did have a Nobel Prize, which I surely hope to get at some point in my life. No, just kidding. But if I had thought of something like this, everyone would listen to me and it would think I'm right. Which is true. But anyhow, what he suggests is these top 10 things that are really important in the world. And I think, actually, these are pretty good. There's nothing wrong with these statements, I think, are true. So if you look at them, what do they list out? The number one thing in the world that's dealing with problems is what? What is it? Water. Energy. Water. Food. Fire. Poverty. War. Disease. Education. Democracy. Which I think is huge today, right? That's what I said earlier on. I wish there was like a truth detector on people <clears throat> in our population. And why is that so important? Well, if you think about the world and what's going to happen to it, you look at how populated it is. Um, huge populations in China and India. Does anyone know what their populations are? So they're up here. 1.3 billion people in China. 1.2 billion people are in India. You know how many people live in the United States? Six, no. Don't believe. No. No, no, that's wrong. Uh, you're off by order of magnitude. Eight. Huh? Eight. No. You're very, very close. About 350 million people. That's it. So now you look at China. 300 million versus a billion. Oh, United States? 
huge difference. Did in you the say number. in the United States? Yes, it does. So if you look at the whole world, it's around four billion. So the majority of the world, the majority of the world lives in India and China. Huge populations. Can you imagine what they're going to need in the future? It's going to be huge. Think about what we consume energy-wise and water-wise and food-wise now in our little United States. It's quite large. The fields that if you decide to choose to go into are going to have, if you make a decision to try to impact this, you can contribute to something that's going to be huge. And it's already big issues now. So I'm going to end right here. Hopefully, I inspired you a little bit, gave you some ideas. And if there's any particular questions about what I just spoke about, I'm happy to answer them.